Most of you know his background, but uh, he's um, right. been from a very powerful family, Procter & Gamble family, and uh, he spent his life uh, trying to figure out the answers to why, you know, where people aren't driving. And uh, he and I and Bob have gotten together in the last four or five months. We spoke together in, at Libertopia to about 500 people, and it was about 500 people there uh, in September. And uh, we decided we really want to do everything we can to support Bob's mission here with Titania and these octologues and this whole movement. So that's why we're here, and Foster is graciously uh, going to give us some time. So, Mr. Foster Gamble. Okay. Now, hello, everyone, and, and thank you for letting me join you tonight. It's a little strange not being able to actually see you, <laughs> uh, but I uh, imagine you there, and I could feel your enthusiasm. I've been listening in on some of the, the previous talks. I'm a big admirer of both uh, Bob and Clyde, so it's really uh, exciting for me to get to be a third musketeer with them tonight. So uh, I'm just going to spend a few minutes kind of bringing you up to date on what's going on in the Thrive world and how I see it connecting really importantly with Titania and the whole themes of your uh, exploration tonight and those of you who choose to participate in the, the uh, further work of the workshop on the weekend. But just as a little reality check, uh, raise your hand if you have, if you're familiar with Thrive, if you've seen the movie and if you're familiar with Thrive movement. And if somebody could tell me uh, what percentage of the hands are up, that'll help me. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. I would say about 65, 70 percent of the room. Okay, at great. Least, at least. Okay. All right. Well, let me give you a, a little update on the status of Thrive. The movie came out a little over two years ago, and I'm happy to report that it's been seen by over 22 million people around the world and has been, is still being seen by over a million people a month in 27 languages, and that's really with essentially no marketing except uh, my wife, Kimberly, and I do a lot of interviews. And so it's been very heartwarming to see how much people have trusted the message and passed it on to their friends, because it's a very challenging message about what's really going on in the world that's in the way of our thriving. So we don't shy away from uh, exposing the global agenda for domination. Uh, and as it shows up in uh, money and in the military and in education and in agriculture and energy and media and literally every sector, every major sector of, of human endeavor. And we follow the money upstream to show how that works, how the, the, uh, the control is almost always in the hands of the same few people. And then we go into what their agenda is, you know, what they're doing and why. And, but then the, the, the primary, the bulk of the movie, the, both at the beginning and then especially at the end, is about what we can do about it. And uh, that's what interested me in Bob, because uh, I was traveling on an airplane. I, I, I'm sent a lot of things, so it takes me a long time often to, to get to a chance to read through screenplays and, uh, and novels and poems and uh, concertos and all sorts of things. That, uh, and so I took uh, Flourish on the airplane with me, and I started reading as we took off, and I didn't put it down till we landed. And then I wrote to Bob saying I was so thrilled that I really felt like I had found a serious ally out there in the world because he has an understanding of what I think is the most important conversation on the planet today. And those of you who have seen Thrive, you know that I've done a lot of research for my entire life in all the major sectors. So for me to say that something is the most important conversation is not said lightly at all. Um, and I'll spend a little time telling you why I think it's the most important conversation. And then when we get into the question and answer period, I look forward to participating with, with you and with the other two and interacting about uh, you know, what your questions and comments about this area are. So uh, in looking into all the major areas, the, the critical issues in all the major areas and writing articles, about them for our website, it was a pretty depressing task. 
and uh, because it's just one problem after another after another. And uh, finally, I had a breakthrough as I was writing these articles, and all of a sudden, I started getting really exhilarated because I realized that that all of the problems that I was identifying, whether it was the banking scam or GMOs or chemtrails or uh, fluoride or media consolida consolidation or false flag events to start uh, fake wars and so forth, they all kept leading back to a very few people. It wasn't that humanity was hopeless. It was that we had been duped for centuries, actually, into giving power away to the very structure of authority that we've been indoctrinated into and then to the very psychopaths and sociopaths that both Bob and Clyde had referred to. So that was the good news, that there's actually a very few sick people in, in charge of most of the, the control centers. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's not like we have a, this giant comet rushing toward Earth and we don't know what to do about it. We do know what to do about this. We need to expose the truth. And then, as Bob was mentioning, um, and, and Clyde, actually, to to build the alternative system so that when the old system comes down, and it is, as it's getting exposed, it's crumbling under its own corruption. Um, and as that comes down, we can't just get sucked into the next police state, the next regime. We actually need to be, uh, we need to have sufficiently in place the alternative media, the alternative currencies, the alternative banking systems, uh, the alternative uh, healthcare systems, uh, agricultural systems. There are viable, healthy alternatives in every single area. And this is the crux of the matter. And I'm going to shift to uh, showing you some pictures now as I talk about this that might make it a little easier to, to understand. <clears throat> You there? Yes. Can okay. you see my pic my screen yet? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. So what you're looking at, especially for those of you who haven't seen the film yet, is what's called the Taurus, T-O-R-U-S. And it's basically the geometric form, the the shape that every sustainable healthy system takes, as far as we can tell, throughout every scale of the universe that we can measure so far from subatomic particles to the clustering of galaxies and now to the so to the to our universe itself. So it's a really important notion because if our evolutionary imperative is to create sustainable healthy systems and the universe actually has a blueprint at every scale, then we might as well understand that as best we can. So what I found uh, well let's go on to the next one before I get on to that. Here are some examples of where the Taurus shows up. It's the electromagnetic field around a live seed. It's the, uh, the electromagnetic field around the Earth itself, around a human being, around a galaxy. And this is a free energy device. It's uh, a, a depiction over here. And it turns out that every single working free energy device that I've had the privilege to see, and, it, and that includes many, Every single one of them is mimicking and honoring the, the energy flow of this toroidal pattern. So this is what nature does too. Nature has a natural toroidal water cycle where the water of the oceans evaporates. It comes in over the land. It condenses, comes down as snow or rain, flows down through the rivers and streams, back in, into the uh, to the ocean and continues to cycle and has for millions of years until we started diverting it, uh, poisoning it, basically destroying the wholeness of the cycle. And, and this is one way that we poison it by, flow, by allowing people to put literally toxic waste, aluminum waste into our water systems that dumbs us down, makes us sick and destroys the wholeness of our hydrological cycle. In agriculture, instead of allowing the organic polyculture, uh, the farmers have had to move to uh, 
monoculture, where it's one crop as far as you can see, with plastic uh, and herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers to try to, to, to get any kind of uh, growth out of the soil. And now to the introduction of actually destroying the, the wholeness even Excuse of me, the genes. Foster, yes. Foster, we're having a problem with sound. Uh, when you're speaking, there's uh, starting to be uh, some crackling on our side. Okay. okay. We will continue. Good. So I was saying that the GMOs now are an example of how you destroy the wholeness, uh, not only of an ecosystem, not only of a seed, but now even of a gene uh, at the just at the core of our food supply. Another example is the banking system. Rather than having a uh, free exchange, volu a voluntary economy, and a, and a true economy has to be voluntary. A, a true economy can't be centralized, uh, otherwise it, the whole thing is going to be coercive. A real economy is the sum total of individual whole beings making voluntary exchanges uh, every day, but instead we've had this pyramid imposed on us, the ultimate hierarchical system that the elites are using to try to take over the whole world, and unfortunately they're, they're very close. On the other hand, fortunately, we're waking up so that that's not how nature works, nor that's, and then that's not how we want to live. And here's another free energy device uh, showing the, the toroidal nature of the, the system. And then particularly talking to you in Fairfield, um, I'm a lifelong meditator myself, a, a, a deeply spiritual uh, being, and th those of you who participated in those kinds of activities, you know your own energy field, and you can feel the toroidal flow uh, that it is. And I could go into showing that the key to, to success in every single sector of human endeavor is honoring the wholeness of every single sovereign being. And it turns out that the solution to every single one of the critical issues that we've identified in Thrive is a recognition that some people are destroying the wholeness of a natural system, whether it's agriculture, economy, media, whatever. And the solution is always allowing and nurturing the restoration of the wholeness of that natural system. And that has to start with the individual. We've been conned over centuries into turning over the sovereignty of the individual to, first of all, the pharaohs, and then you got the kings, and then you've got the dictators, and then you've got the corporations, and, and you've got the so-called democracy, the, the, you know, the mob rule where you're supposed to turn it over to the to the majority for the quote good of the group but the good of the group if it violates the fairness of the individual will as Bob pointed out it will never succeed it, it's a system based on violence that can only spawn violence you know not not peace and prosperity in the long run so that's one of the things that's excited me so much about the the uh, integrity of the Titania project because it is based on the sovereignty of the individual one of my chief mentors, a man from Canada, Stefan Molyneux, probably the most advanced philosopher I've ever come across, uh, said it simply this way, and it shocked me when I read it with its simplicity. He said, the greatest fight in the history of the world and the world of ideas is the fight to establish a universal morality. You know, uh, Bob earlier was talking about uh, this kind of subjective ethics that we've been trained into. Well, no, it turns out that actually the one thing that we at Thrive have found that every single individual we have ever talked to anywhere in the world agrees to is that they don't want to be violated against their will. So if you can imagine trying to come up with anything that every single human being agrees to, maybe we're on to something here with this notion that the, uh, that the sovereignty of the individual can actually be the core, what we call navigating insight for humanity to live on a thri thriving and healthy planet. 
It's based on what's called the non-aggression principle. And it's said simply this way, in a thriving society, no one is allowed to violate anyone else except in true self-defense. So unfortunately, I have met a shocking number of people who do think that they should be able to coerce other people because they're smarter or more enlightened or richer or whiter or more powerful or whatever it is, whatever excuse they've got. Uh, but they, of course, themselves don't want to be violated by anyone else against their will. So at Thrive, uh, our film has inspired um, self-creating solutions groups all over the world, which was a dream come true for us. And these solutions groups are uh, taking on over 200 issues. I'll, I'll go to on. Hey, Foster, one sec. Yes. Um, did you turn off your picture? All we can see now is a still picture of you. We're not seeing your actual image. Okay. It's no, switched. I didn't. Um, yeah. Let's connect one more time. Okay. So I was starting to say that uh, as Kimberly and I traveled around the world uh, visiting many, many cities, uh, what we found is that Thrive Inspired Solutions groups were spontaneously springing up. And they're taking on over 200 issues. And they, uh, the, the issues are in all different sectors. This image is a, uh, a picture of the geometry that we use for our organizational structure. This is the 12 around one of what Bucky Fuller called the vector equilibrium. It's kind of the mother geometry of space itself. And reduced to two dimensions, it creates this wheel. And we invite uh, anyone in our solutions group to identify their purpose in life, the particular sector that they're most interested in and skilled at, and then to choose their particular issue of choice and then use our solutions hub to connect with other people who are working on that issue or in that sector all around the world. And there are already uh, over 900 groups in 96 countries who are doing this all independently, yet connected through our solutions hub. And the only agreements that they have to be a part of this group is one that they, if they're going to use the sector uh, title, they use the same sector titles as everyone else because that allows us to coordinate activities worldwide. And then secondly, that uh, their solutions can involve the creation of no new violations. And this is the key to the whole thing. This, it is, these are all solutions initiatives based on the principles of integrity and non-violation rather than the coercion of politics. It's one of the reasons why I think that it's grown so fast and has excited so many young people and people who are sick of the, the gridlock uh, and combat of politics. So people can find one another uh, through our website by a multitude of issues, and then they can report in their success stories, uh, and we can share those stories with our whole network, and they can share best practices. So people don't have to go out and create the same lawsuit, the same petition, the same artwork. They can share that with one another. So everybody's saving time and not having to recreate the wheel. So our goal is to help facilitate a network of networks with non-coercive solutioning worldwide. Let me back up for just a second here. Hey, Foster, uh, while you're doing that, I, I just want to let you know, I, saw, I just saw stop smart meters below there. Yes. You know that we, we got the city to uh, stop smart meters here. Oh, Fairfield. fantastic. In Fairfield? Yeah, that, they... The, the status of that is that they take them out now, right? If we want them out, right? Patrick? That no. is con oh, fantastic. Congratulations. Uh, our community in, uh, in Santa Cruz that first started using this 12-sector model to stop George Bush from spraying us with toxins back in 2007, we created a, an activist network that we, and we all saved our emails. And when the smart meter thing came along, we were able to instantly mobilize and we're actually the first county in the country to ban the mandatory installation. So I'm glad to hear that you all have been able to succeed in that too. It, it's really sweeping the country and the world now. 
Yeah. But but to go back to this um, this non coercion. People are used to thinking of themselves as having to identify on the political spectrum. And this is kind of our 3D version of the usual political spectrum where you get the liberal Democrat on the left and the conservative Republican on the right and and maybe a centrist in the middle. And people think, okay, those are. Are you showing us? Are you showing us something right now? All right. We're going to call you again. Okay, I appreciate everyone's patience on this. Well, you know what it is? We just we just figured it out here, all these brilliant technical people here. They think it's Skype. It's not our fault because Skype has been doing this a lot lately. Uh, I, I agree. And all, also all the changing of pictures that I'm doing can kind of max out Skype's bandwidth sometimes. So this has happened in, in some other calls as well. Okay. Okay, so... All right, so now can you see this picture? Yes, yes. There you go. We got it. Okay, great. So uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is kind of a 3D version of what's called the Nolan Diagram, where it, it helps people to realize that the entire political spectrum is a spectrum of violence-based coercion. If government needs taxes in order to survive, and taxes are the act of taking some of your hard-earned income, whether you like it or not, then a more common word for that is theft. And it's based on the threat of violence. And if you don't agree with that, just try not paying your taxes um, and see what happens. And so if we add the, the, the other axis to this, beyond the sort of uh, spectrum of hidden violence that we've been accustomed to, is down at the bottom your pure, your pure authoritarian state. But up at the top, when you actually lift off of this whole spectrum, that's where you move into the true world of liberty, and especially to what we call voluntarism. Uh, libertarianism is a step on the way where government is reduced to only the protection of individual rights. But ultimately, if it's government, it's not protecting your right not to have your money taken against your will. So it's a stepping stone to a true voluntarist uh, society. And obviously, that's a really big discussion but it's the one that I referred to earlier as the most important one uh, on the planet. So let me show you one more ah. picture. Has, did it go out again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. You'll be glad to know that this is my last picture. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll be back. All right. Okay. So... Um, so for me, the essential insight for us to not only survive but to thrive is that the core unit, unit of wholeness at the level of humanity is the individual. And Henry David Thoreau is one of the people who realized this. And I think it's one of the reasons why his fame is only growing now. And he's known for, for writing for everything thousand hacking at the leaves of evil there is one striking the root in other words going right to the core of the matter of freedom and in my honest assessment uh, Bob Podolsky is one of those rare ones that is actually going to the root of the matter so I am honored to be associated and I'll wrap up my remarks there and look forward to participating uh, with the rest of you in Q&A Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Anybody like to ask Boss for any questions, or anybody else, Bob or me? Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. I'll have to repeat it. So I asked me the question. Okay. Right. Okay. So the question is, is there still a lot of gross ignorance in the world and consciousness is rising? Um, so is that it? And then what, what, speak to that. How do you see that? How do you see that unraveling? This is something that Foster and Bob and I talked about for hours in San Diego. So go ahead, Foster. You got yeah, and, and tell me your, your vision of the format here. Do you Want me to just answer a few questions on, on what I said, or do you, well, do you want to answer questions all three together? What would work best for you? We'll, what we'll do is, um, 
you take that question and we'll let the people we'll we'll let them have the freedom to choose which of us they would like to ask okay, a great. question to. How's okay. that sound? That sounds perfect. All right. Go ahead, Foster. You okay, answer. so in terms of um, ignorance in the world and consciousness rising, uh, absolutely, yes, both are prevalent <laughs> in my observation. Uh, I, I'm happy to say that as Kimberly and I have traveled to over 40 cities around the world, we find ourselves more optimistic than we've been in the last 15 years because you don't get to read in mainstream about the phenomenal waking up that is going on. But the Internet um, is and independent media have had such an effect, and it's only growing uh, geometrically, exponentially around the world. So we're seeing people who are finally hearing a coherent story, just as we presented in, in Thrive. Even though it's a tough one, at least it makes sense. And that once they get that, they're like, oh, okay, that's not all good news, but at least I feel like I can get some traction. I can put my feet on the ground now and take some effective actions. So ignorance to me is completely different than stupidity. You know, we're all ignorant of that which we don't know yet. And there's so much that people don't know yet uh, about all kinds of various topics, but we're learning fast through the internet. And I think one of the major skills for survival is open-mindedness. It's not just, you know, being smart or something like that. It's, it's being open to what you need to hear and at the same time, having enough discernment to not just believe everything you hear. So there's lots of ignorance, but the ignorance is being dispelled faster than any point in human history. Because people can now get direct access to information on virtually any subject, you know, on their mobile device. And be able to talk about it with their trusted friends. And uh, in terms of the consciousness arising... I observe that it is absolutely vast, it's unstoppable, even if it's going to be messy, even if it's already tremendously painful for billions of people. But I see, especially within the last year, I see a, a turning point, a tipping point. Uh, I think Clyde was referring to Malcolm Gladwell before. I, I, I experienced that we've crossed the tipping point of exposure of the, uh, the hidden covert agenda for domination and the blossoming of unstoppable independent consciousness. And by that, I mean people who are thinking for themselves and therefore beginning to realize that we live in an, an alive, interconnected universe of infinite energy and love and consciousness, and that that's the, the nature of our true being. And it, no matter what people tell us about how stupid and incompetent and how we need to be controlled by a few elite and so forth. Uh, for the most part, people just aren't buying it anymore. People are turning away from the traditional so-called schooling systems that have really been indoctrination factories for the most part and are doing the thinking on their own. And then I think that the consciousness that is emerging in all of us um, is the evolutionary force that is absolutely throughout the cosmos, as far as my scientific uh, studies ha have revealed, and that there is a, a uh, an arrow of time that always moves, you know, it has hiccups in it, but it always moves ultimately toward increased complexity, intelligence, you know, consciousness, and love. And I also want to just have, I'll take this moment, I'm thrilled to be able to acknowledge Fairfield for being absolutely one of the major hubs on the planet of that. I ran a company in Silicon Valley for eight years called uh, Mind Center. And we, it was a brainwave biofeedback training center where people came and used the state-of-the-art technology of brainwave biofeedback that we had developed to basically enhance their meditation. Some people did it for therapy. Some people did it for creativity enhancement, some for stress reduction. Most of them uh, found dramatic, dramatic quantum leaps in their spiritual development by, by learning how to relax their body, let their emotions flow harmoniously, and then to tune their brain waves to various frequencies, various amplitudes, and various levels of coherence that would open up other realms of realization. And I know that the studies that, that uh, the TM group has done uh, on coherence in, in group meditation, on 
uh, reduction of crime rates in various cities that people have been to have been absolute you know, landmark foundation stones in the building of this new consciousness worldwide and of its scientific validation. Right. Thank you, Foster. We appreciate that. And I just wanted to, you know, Foster knows Jeffrey Smith. You all know Jeffrey Smith. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of uh, Institute for Responsible Technologies with Jeffrey. Good. We were on a board meeting a few days ago. And uh, speaking of the tipping point, his whole thing has always been to create this tipping point mm -hmm. uh, of en enough people who have awareness of GMO that they will stop eating it. And then the food companies will start to respond. That's what we call the tipping point. Jeffrey exactly. and it's already happening, particularly yes. in the GMO yep. area. Yeah. It's already happening all over the world. Hungary, India, Mexico, I just Italy, country after country is, is saying, you know, hell no. Right. Well, Jeffrey was announcing that oh, was, was what is it, Rice Krispies? Which Cheerios, Cheerios is Cheerios, now right. going to be non GMO. I'm sure you've heard that. And, well, see, uh, I think that the, I think that yeah. the reason why Cheerios is at the leading edge is because it's all those little Taurus forms. <laughs> Sorry, I that couldn't must resist. be it. That must be it. But uh, it's great. But anyway, that you know, he said he thinks the tipping point, the full tipping point on GMO, is within a year away. I do too. Yeah, yeah. So good. Any other question? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, wait, wait a minute. There was one back here. Get over here, Mark. Mark's a great friend of mine. Hi, Mark. Foster, I've done a lot of work, uh, has, as Clyde has, in the last 20 years with regard to... I'm there now they can see. Oh, okay. With regard to um, common law, constitutional law, and obviously the problem has always been that constitutional law doesn't have any teeth, and it's been dormant and nascent because of that, because, there's no, because the enforcement capacity has always been with the de facto governments all over the world and the central banking system. Right. So the question is, um, with Bob, I'm going to misuse a word and say, how can ethical people, how can those who have standards overcome those who have no standards and are amoral, who have weaponry, and how will this occur? Yeah, uh, it's such a great question. Uh, it took me about two months to really open up to this conversation. And then about a year uh, to feel like I was getting my mind kind of wrapped around it, and then 10 more years of study. And, and uh, what I can say is there are certain people like Murray Rothbard and Stefan Molyneux and Larkin Rose, if you know any of those names, people who uh, have spelled out how all of these different things can work. Uh, and an example is that you're still going to need security systems to, that you can call to protect yourself. I see that my picture is locked up. <laughs> uh, no, you're okay. Yeah. Oh, it's locked up. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's, it's actually been going back and forth somewhat, although it's been locked okay. up for quite a while. I'll, I'll just continue with the audio yeah, anyway. That's fine. And uh, so imagine there's a society that doesn't have any centralized monopoly on money or on force, but there are independent uh, justice organizations. I uh, call them dispute resolution organizations that would work kind of like the mediation or arbitration right now. Um, but they're, they're competing organizations that have to establish a consistent track record of non-violation uh, and of fair decision making in order to get clients to stay in business and in order to keep their insurance, in order to stay in business. So then you've got a combination of dispute resolution organizations independently competing for an ethical reputation. You've got private insurance companies that have to compete for an ethical rep reputation as opposed to these, these health insurance organizations and AIG and so forth that are all you know, government subsidized and therefore taking over. And, uh, and then you've got the... Uh, private security organizations too. And everybody says, oh, oh, that's like Blackwater, you mean they're gonna have civil wars amongst these mercenary armies? Uh, no, Blackwater gets away with their, all their violation because they're uh, protected by the coercive state. So all the security organizations, it'd be like a private police force at a corporation or at a shopping center, or at a 
a, a community or something like that where people pay a subscription so that you can call them and they'll come by and uh, check on your house periodically and that type of thing. But they too have to compete for a an ethical reputation of using their force only in the protection of life and in the enforcement of contracts, that type of thing, not not any uh, the course of bullying like goes on now. So I, and to sum up a huge conversation, we cannot wait until um, a, a critical mass of people in the, in the, on the planet are enlightened or much less until everyone is enlightened in order to have this behavior. Look, at, look how close we are to a global police state already. But we can translate enlightened realization, which is fundamentally you don't get to violate me and take my stuff and I don't get to violate you and take your stuff. It's the fundamental nature of the golden rule uh, at every level, uh, we can uh, incorporate that realization, that enlightened insight into the core of the justice system so that people run up against the boundaries of, uh, if I try to, to pollute your uh, water supply, or I try to pollute the air that you're breathing, or I try to come over and take some of your property, or I try to gather a few of my friends and wage war against the next community or something like that, all of that will be prosecuted and those guilty will be held responsible and need to make restitution to the full extent to those who have been harmed. I wanted to ask Foster one more question. Foster, um you know, it's seen, we were talking about the Octolog workshops, and then you're talking about all your groups that you have in your 12 areas all over the, all over the world, and it sounds like you've already implemented uh, the non-coercive principle, unanimity, and a lot of the things that, almost all the principles that we talk about in the Titanium Octologs. What about just um, having, making available to all of those people the Titanium workshop, Titanium workshop? We'd be done. <laughs> yeah, It'd be over. Yeah, let me let me address uh, that a little bit because I'm much more familiar with the principles uh, of liberty, particularly as expressed in in Bob's Bill of Ethics and his Code of Honor, and uh, especially very specifically in his uh, principles of the ethical contract. Uh, I'm I have not personally participated in an octologue. I've been involved a lot in small group activity, and I think that the principles of the octologue are like uh, a platonic ideal of how a small group would work. I, I think that, uh, and I think it can be very powerful held as an ideal like that to where you keep the group small enough to be effective, you balance the genders as much as possible, you have no non-coercive decision-making as much as possible. And I think that, uh, that that's really helpful as long as it doesn't become a bottleneck where people need to master the octologue and, and only have eight people in the group and only have four women and four men and so forth in order to function. If we had tried to do that to our, you know, uh, 937 groups around the world, I don't know how many groups we would have. But what we do is we offer a toolkit uh, where we suggest to people effective principles for small group decision making and conflict resolution and uh, and strategizing for uh, effectiveness in uh, solutions tactics and that type of thing. And I think th that including the uh, principles of the Octolog can be uh, very effective in that. So we can explore as we go forward how to kind of combine the best of, the, uh, of all the different things we've been doing, but I can't claim to have expertise in the Octolog process itself yet. Right, so... Um I think that's exactly right. We wouldn't want the octolog training to stop anything that anybody is doing that's that's ethical and creative and doing good. Um, I'm just saying that if if you not only with your group but other groups that are out there, if we can offer um, the this training to people that already have existing groups like yours, then uh, that could make this thing happen a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. But I think right now what we need to do is focus on getting more than one octolog. And yeah. we have one octolog that's been created uh, after Libertopia in Phoenix. And we have Kevin Innes here. Uh, do you want to stay on, Foster? I think what we'll do is we'll shift now to 
we'd love you to stay on sure. if you can. But I think we'll shift to talking about the specifics of this weekend's group. We, we have to do this now. I'll take your question afterwards, though. Okay. 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 Kevin, would you come up? I've been involved with workshops for many years about personal empowerment, working with others. But finally, I found through the ideas uh, Bob was talking about, a type of system that really made sense. Wow, ethics in the group. I mean, I work with folks and I've done workshops on uh, consensus meeting skills for people. And But to have a group of people working together with ethics as a foundation makes all the difference. And he goes into great uh, depth about how it is that having that ethical foundation just makes for a much more powerful synergy amongst the people in the group. And having, and uh, backs this up with uh, his research that he's done for many years and the people. Are you, are you confident that you know how to create unanimity that in a group sense now that you've taken the training? Well, the foundations, the structure, the foundation about how, about um, the group, consensus. yes, unanimity. the group, there, some of the techniques for building that consensus need to be fleshed out, but that's uh, the actual core structure of why it is that it works really hit home for me. And um, and uh, it was a great group of people we worked with who were mostly in the Phoenix air, uh, area. And uh, I'm and looking you forward. Do you have some plans for creating octologues in North Carolina, you were telling me? Yes, uh, I'm the uh, outreach director for the Libertarian Party of North Carolina. And I'm, we're working regionally to set up uh, working groups. And the octologue uh, uh, system is going to be very good for that. And I'll be at uh, New Hampshire at the Liberty Forum next uh, month talking about that as well. And there's a big interest in uh, the Free State pro Project finding groups of people that will not only come together, but they'll find good reasons to stay together and continue to work and, and enjoy the process of doing good things in the world. I mean, it makes, uh, yeah, so I had a, a good time at the workshop, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing it again, actually. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. So uh, I just want to thank the three speakers who were here. They were each incredibly cogent and, and persuasive in their own right, different flavors. So can we give them a large, large applause?